What's up, guys? My name is Jake, and welcome to Cancelled, Episode 7. This is the show where we look into everything and anything that was eventually cancelled. This video is sponsored by Audible. Use my link, audible.com bsf, or text bsf to 500-500 to get a free book, plus two Audible originals, and a 30-day trial. For quite a while, Disney's Animal Kingdom has been my favorite theme park in the world. Its mixture of intense theming and storytelling throughout creates an atmosphere and feeling for me that's kind of hard to explain. Pretty much every original concept proposed in the final stages of its development had been fully realized in the final product, which for Disney in the late 1990s was kind of rare. Though there was one section of the park well known as an ambitious, integral part of Animal Kingdom's story. An entire land teased for years, only to never come to fruition. That was the mystical land of Beastly Kingdom. Back in the early 1990s, the Walt Disney Company had reaped their success of the new MGM Studios Park, and were looking to build something new to compete with other prominent zoological parks in the area. Disney officially announced their fourth and final park in Florida called Animal Kingdom, set to be built on the severe southwest side of the property. The core concept behind this park, from an entertainment standpoint, was to mix traditional attractions and shows with the living ecosystems of the planet. Seven different lands had been planned around various themes that the park had to deliver on. There was the oasis in the main entrance area, showcasing exotic birds and reptiles, Safari Village with the Tree of Life and various restaurants and shops acting as the hub, Africa with the flagship safari attraction and the expansive savanna, Asia with future attractions planned, Dinoland USA showcasing extinct real-life animals, and finally, Beastly Kingdom, a land promising to bring guests the creatures of fiction and legend. Beastly Kingdom was planned to be built on the left side of Safari Village, now called Discovery Island. After you cross the bridge over to the land, you would enter a mystical world divided into two sections, good and evil. Each would be themed accordingly, and feature their own attractions and corresponding entertainment. Starting off in the good realm would be the prominently placed garden called Quest for the Unicorn, a mystical hedge maze that would eventually lead you into a cavern where guests would be able to view an animatronic unicorn. Beside it would be the Fantasia Gardens boat ride, based on the classic 1941 film. This log flume ride would have brought guests through the different wondrous scenes of the animated movie. The lush, bubbly fairy tale theming would lead you over another bridge to the side of evil. Here would lay the park's only other e ticket attraction, Dragon's Tower. This was going to be a high speed coaster, the only one in the park set on the story of a medieval castle that has now been taken over by an evil dragon. As the story goes, the castle is also inhabited by bats, who enlist the help of guests to steal back the treasure, guarded by an angry dragon. The ride vehicles were designed as large cauldrons, which guests would ride in, with bats carrying you above on a suspended track. The finale would rush guests through a large cobblestone room with a fire-breathing animatronic dragon, which all in all would have certainly made it one of the most thrilling attractions in Walt Disney World. Overall, the land would have taken up around 14 acres of space, and while there's no official numbers on the project, given the level of ambition on Dragon's Tower and the overall theming, I would imagine it was at the cost of hundreds of millions of dollars. So Disney broke ground on Animal Kingdom in the mid-1990s, with lead Imagineer Joe Rohde continuing to push for Beastly Kingdom. However, as the enormous $1 billion theme park began to go over budget, funds were siphoned off and put elsewhere. Actually, Disney, especially under the leadership of late 90s Michael Eisner, had to cut and push many of the key aspects of the park completely or to later dates. And the remaining budget they did have was put to Dinoland USA. Key attractions were cut completely out of the opening day lineup, like the Dinoland Excavation Roller Coaster and the Asian River Rapids Ride. These major cuts had also included Beastly Kingdom. However, this meant a large section of the west side of the park would have nothing in it, so a quick fix would be needed. A sort of temporary land would take the place of Beastly Kingdom, which was now on hold. Camp Mini Mickey was set to take a very small portion of the allocated land set for Beastly Kingdom, and now be used as a dedicated character meet and greet spot. So on April 22nd, 1998, Disney's Animal Kingdom had opened to the public, as did the temporary Camp Mini Mickey. <laughs> Introducing the most adventurous Walt Disney World theme park ever. Disney's Animal Kingdom. The imagination of Disney gone wild. But Beastly Kingdom still had a looming presence in the park, 
hinting at what was still very much intended to come. Marketing throughout the park's first year had prominently featured a dragon, showcasing the original themes to the park, meaning the fairy tale aspect was still yet to come. In the first year of the park, operating around Safari Village was a short-lived attraction not many people know about. It was called the Discovery Riverboats, which was a mixture between a themed attraction and a legitimate transportation method to navigate the expansive park. With very few opening day attractions, the Discovery Riverboats were able to cleverly tease upcoming projects. Each lands the boats passed through gave a piece of theming on the river to identify what's there. Africa had its Port of Harambe and the geysers, Dinoland had the bathing iguanodon in the swamp, and interestingly, when the boats passed by Camp Mini Mickey, elements of the upcoming Beastly Kingdom were being teased. A makeshift stone dragon had pouring water out of its mouth, and further down the river was a rock formation which gave the illusion that a dragon had been inhabiting. Once the boat was clear of the path, a large burst of fire would shoot out of the cave. Originally, during cast member previews of the park, melted and skewered knights would be placed around this cave. However, they were cut from the park's opening since they were a little too gruesome for families. The Discovery River boats didn't last very long in Animal Kingdom for a multitude of reasons, and ended operation just a year after the park opened. It was promised that Beastly Kingdom was set to begin construction in 1999 or 2000 as the second phase of Animal Kingdom. However, Disney was still feeling the financial heat of the Euro Disneyland disaster, and most of the major projects had been put on hold. Animal Kingdom had become a half-day park, and with lower attendance numbers, the several hundred million dollars set for one land was better off being spent elsewhere. Just down the road as well, Universal had recently opened their new theme park, Islands of Adventure. The Lost Continent was one of the key lands within, home to attractions and theming somewhat similar to that of the concepts of Beastly Kingdom. So at that point, especially so close to Universal's new park debut, Disney would kind of look like they had copied what was built down I-4. And by this point, Beastly Kingdom had been officially cancelled. Thirteen years had passed with Camp Mini Mickey holding its never-intended long-term place on the expansion pad. But finally in 2011, Disney announced they had struck a deal with James Cameron and Lightstorm Entertainment to bring the 2009 blockbuster Avatar to Animal Kingdom in the form of its very own land. At the cost of $500 million, Disney was going to build Pandora, the fictional planet the film takes place on. In 2014, Camp Mini Mickey closed permanently and was demolished to make way for this new land. This time, the entire expansion pad crafted just for Beastly Kingdom was maximized to bring the new land to fruition. And finally, after over three years of construction, the incredibly impressive Pandora The World of Avatar opened officially to the public. After the opening of Animal Kingdom back in 1998, and the subsequent cancellation of Beastly Kingdom, the park had finally received some more e-ticket attractions to boost attendance without building a whole new land. The raft ride had been built in Asia under the new name Cali River Rapids, and the park finally got a roller coaster with Expedition Everest. And while Beastly Kingdom never came to fruition, the legacy of the never-built land continues to live on within the park. Much of the marketing material and logos for Animal Kingdom still prominently feature the dragon. It can still be seen on some of the park benches, mainly in the oasis, and is even found on the park entrance along with other mystical creatures. As for the theming along the river to tease what was to come, well, actually most of it remains there. In 2014, the stone dragon creature thing had its water pumps turned off, and since the opening of Pandora, it still remains inactive. A pathway to connect Pandora to Africa had also been created to add better flow, which meant guests can now walk past a previously forested area on the water. The wooden pathway now directs people basically on top of where the fire-breathing dragon in the cave used to be. While much of the cave has been removed, a lot of the jagged rockwork still remains. A lot of people say that they would have much rather preferred Beastly Kingdom over what was actually built. Though, perhaps it's my own unpopular opinion, but I actually kind of prefer Pandora over the concepts for Beastly Kingdom. While I think the Dragon Tower coaster would have been very cool, I perceive the overall theming as a little boring and overdone. It's somewhat European approach to a theme park land, with hedge mazes and bubbly fairy tale theming, seems kind of bland and similar to what was already built in Disneyland Paris. I think Pandora, no matter what it's based off of, is an incredibly impressive work of engineering, theming, and immersion. And it still kind of brought the park's original core themes to life with animals of myth and legend, while also trying to teach an environmental lesson. Though for some, it's one of the most ambitious themed lands in Walt Disney World. One crafted for a brand new theme park, only for itself to remain a legend.
What? What are you doing? I'm an audible listening to Harry Potter Goblet of Fire. Um, you do realize we're in a theme park right now, right? Also, haven't you already read that? I'm not reading it, I'm listening to it. Plus, I got it for free. Don't you know you get a 30-day free trial with audible.com slash bsf? Okay, but that doesn't explain why you're in a theme park listening to it. I mean, it makes it so easy to enjoy it anywhere. Why not a theme park? Uh, right. Well, I've been doing a whole thing on Beastly Kingdom today. What have you been doing? Guys, please go check them out. It's the perfect place to listen to your favorite Harry Potter book and their new Audible Originals, which are exclusive audio titles created by celebrated storytellers. Along with access to new fitness audio content, Audible members will now get a credit for two free Audible Originals every month. Just use the link audible.com bsf or text bsf to 500-500 to get this great offer. Anyway guys, my name is Jake. Follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. And thank you very much for watching.